Well, we're back. It's good to be seen. Okay, I can't see anybody yet. Nobody's here yet. Um, let's pray. Ask the Lord to be with us today. Father, I ask you to be with us as we do this Bible study tonight. I ask that you um, bring in the ones that you want to be here. I ask that you be with us as we study your word. I ask that you share with us what you would have us to know and be with us. And I praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, cool. It's good to see you guys. Um, I want to give a special shout out to those who I know that there's at least one household that is um, having having a watch party or whatever, you know, um, that there's somebody uh, in this county or the next that every Monday night invites friends over to watch, be a part of this, and they have church with us in that way. And I, that's kind of cool. Uh, hey, Gary. And so I appreciate that y'all spend the time to be a part of this. I'll let you watch it on YouTube or off the website, off um, Facebook at different times. Um, that's very humbling. It's cool. So we're in verse 3 of Acts chapter 14. I have been writing like mad. I, I haven't been feeling well the last couple of days. I must have knocked out 14 or 15 pages of the text. I'm having a ball writing this. Um, we're going to go back to Acts 14.1. And so now it, it happened in Iconium that they, that would be Paul and Barnabas, went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a mul great multitude of both the Jews and the Greeks believed. So that means that, that at Iconium, uh, Paul and Barnabas spoke and, and uh, a number of the Jewish people and the Gentiles there became Christians. They believed. However, in verse 2, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Um, the unbelieving Jews. Uh, we talked about last time that the word unbelieving didn't have to do with um, being ignorant or not knowing. It had to do, Helen, it had to do with choosing to not believe, to on purpose ignore the things that God is showing uh, somebody. So they, they were doing this on purpose, and anything that came to them would be their own um, doing. And so. <clears throat> Uh, that's what they did. Paul and Barnabas find themselves being attacked. And I love how they're described by Luke. He says, um, poison their minds against the brethren. And so it stirs up the Gentiles. So here we have Jews who won't have anything to do with non-Jews. Um, uh, stirring them up. They have something to do with them when it comes against when it comes to coming against Jesus. Have you noticed that? <clears throat> the groups of people who wouldn't have anything to do with each other. Uh, suddenly will find themselves in league with one another because they're coming against Christ. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, Jesus uh, unites people. Um, um, and so they poison their minds against the brethren. And uh, Luke refers to uh, Paul and Barnabas as the brethren. These two men and all Christians who are living or have gone before us are our brothers, the fellow members of the family of God. And so I like that term, brethren. Uh, one of the ladies I pastor refers to all uh, women Christian as her sisters. I always like that. I also love Paul and Barnabas' response on verse 3, Acts 14, verse 3. Therefore, they stayed there for a long time. <laughs> so people are having their minds poisoned against what Barnabas and Paul are teaching. So their re response is they're not going anywhere. So they remained there. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, the sin of those coming against them caused Paul and Barnabas to want to hang around a long time, and it caused them to be speaking boldly in the Lord. Now, there are many who teach today that when things become difficult, that this is a sign from God that he doesn't want us to persevere. In contrast to that, these men did not let the attacks against them drive them off. I really, I don't believe that because things get hard, then obviously God's not in it. If that was the case, then God wasn't in Jesus walking into Jerusalem and then um, 
coming out carrying a cross he was going to be crucified on. Sometimes things God have us to do. Bonsoir, Marie. Uh, sometimes uh, God, things God would have us to do are difficult, and uh, that's okay. Uh, and so <clears throat> um, the sin of those coming against them didn't run them off. It caused them to be speaking boldly in the Lord. To speak boldly is a Greek term that means that they exercise freedom or frankness in speaking, to speak openly and without constraint. I think, I think if we're free in Christ, then we ought to be free to say what we believe the Lord would have us to say and not let anybody constrain us, not let anybody convince us not to do it. And so they were speaking boldly. They exercised freedom or they were frank in their speaking. They spoke openly and without constraint. In other words, they didn't let any humans control how they went about doing their mission for the Lord. They said what they sensed needed, sent, what they sensed needed to be said. However, they did let someone with capital S influencing them be influencing them as they were speaking boldly in that term in the Lord. This means that they were careful to only speak those things which the Lord told them to speak. I wonder what would happen if we conducted ourselves that way in our everyday life. What would happen if all we ever talked about was the things God told us to to say and how we said the same and the timing when we pull the trigger on those things. So let's see what Jesus did through them. Therefore, they stayed there a long time. They, were, I love that. I just love that. People are after them. People are trying to make them miserable, and so they don't run away. They stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who is bearing witness to the word of His grace. <clears throat> now, why did I say something? about what what Jesus did through them. Let's look at what Luke wrote. He said, Jesus was bearing witness to the word of his grace. When he uses the singular was, he wasn't referring, Luke wasn't referring to what the two people were doing. If he was referring to what Paul and Barnabas were doing, he would have used the plural verb, were. Instead, he was referring to what one most important person with a capital P, Jesus, was doing through them because they were speaking boldly in the Lord, in the Lord, and not in their own flesh. Jesus was bearing witness to the word of his grace. Isn't that beautiful? What does that mean? It means that he was revealing what he knew to be true about himself. That's what bearing witness is about. It's to say what you see. Well, Jesus is per pretty aware of himself all the time. So Jesus was telling them about his grace, or in other words, his empowering equipping. Now, how did he do that? And you'll notice, as I teach this study, or any study I teach, whenever I mention grace, I'm going to go in to depth about it because I think it's one of those words that is taught shallowly in the body of Christ. We teach, we're taught it's amazing. We're taught we don't deserve it. It's defined as unmerited favor. I don't believe that um, tells the whole story of grace. Unmerited in terms of uh, we don't do anything to earn it. That's true. But it is merited if the king wants to give it. So I'm always going to be talking in depth about grace. So in this case, what did that grace entail? <clears throat> he was granting, it says in, in this verse, in, um, in uh, Acts 14, 3, he was granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. There are two things here for us to see. If you've been in my studies, you know I'm going to try to milk every bit of meaning out of what we read. I'm not going to try to add anything to it. I just don't want us to miss anything. The Holy Spirit has a great vocabulary, a great command of all the languages. So when he had him say things in the Greek, when he had Luke write things in the Greek, and all gets translated, he knows exactly what he wants to say. So he was granting signs and wonders done to be done by their hands. So two things for us to see. The first is that Paul and Barnabas did not take it upon themselves to schedule a healing or miracle service. 
Jesus granted, or he gave them the gift to be enabled to perform signs and wonders by their hands. That was and will always be the right of Jesus to grant, not ours to decide on our own. We went to Africa a few years ago. Laura and I were invited by the Baptist Union of Sierra Leone, which later became ground zero for the Ebola epidemic. A lot of people that we met, I don't believe are alive anymore because of that epidemic, but we went there to teach. We're invited by the Baptist Union of that nation to teach about the Holy Spirit because he wasn't being taught much in our fellowship. And so we were invited to speak about the Holy Spirit of God. And so we went there and the first thing we saw was huge banners in the capital uh, uh, of that country, um, which I believe is called Freetown, but I'm not, I'm not positive. I um, uh, can't remember what the, the name of the, the city was, but it was basically the only big city in the whole nation. And there were these big banners everywhere uh, for the healing explosion. And there was a denomination there that was luring people from all the other types of churches with promises that because they scheduled the meeting, Jesus was going to be performing signs and wonders. And I really don't think Jesus follows the whims of humans and does our bidding. I don't think he shows up and, his Holy, and the Holy Spirit show up when we schedule a meeting. We're supposed to meet when he says to meet. And if he wants to do miracles and signs and wonders, then he will. And so I think it's really presumptuous for people to advertise that Jesus is going to do miracles at 7 o'clock tomorrow or next week or whatever the date is. You know, I think it's ridiculous. Um, this is God we're talking about. God doesn't obey us. We obey him. And so the first is that they... They did not take it upon themselves to schedule a healing or miracle service. Jesus granted that this would happen. The second thing to see here is that the purpose of these signs and wonders was to do one thing, and that was to reveal Jesus. Signs and wonders and miracles weren't and never will be intended by God to be used to market some earthly Christian business, a congregation, or ministry, or whatever you want to call it. They're here to reveal who Jesus is. That's it. And it's a wonderful thing for someone to be healed. It's a wonderful thing for miracles and signs and wonders to happen, and I've been around some of that. But the purpose of it is for Jesus to reveal himself. Psalm 40, verse 16 says this, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as your love, as love, let's let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord will be magnified. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you and God. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. God is to be magnified. Not humans, not human endeavors, not human organizations. Paul spoke of having worked miracles. And I'm saying that, and I'm telling you, hey, hey, Tina and Brandy and Kara and all these guys that showed up so far. I'm saying that God is to be magnified, not human endeavors, and we have a ministry with a name on it that functions in this county and all over the state and all over, sometimes all over the country and all over the world. But the, the point, <clears throat> it's not wrong to have one of those one of those endeavors in Jesus' name. There's no problem with that. It's that nothing we do is to magnify that. It's to magnify the king. Okay. Paul spoke of having worked miracles in the letters that he wrote to Christians and other places in Galatians 3 5. He says, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, he does it. How does he do it? Does he do it by the works of the law? Or does he do it by the hearing of faith? Does he do it by someone hearing that God wants to do it or because of some system of rules? 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says this, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance 
And how were they done? In signs and wonders and mighty deeds. As he pointed out, as Paul pointed out, miracles, one of the signs or indications that a person had been given the role of apostle. Other signs that a person is an apostle are the ones we're studying about right here now in Acts. Apostles, in the Bible anyway, uh, establish works on behalf of God. They train up other leaders who are going to remain in those places, such as teachers and pastors, which is another word for shepherds. They move on <clears throat> to establish other works. They bring order to the local body of Christ where, or, where disorder exists. They bring disorder to the lost because they confuse them, um, because they're bringing in a new system, the system of grace. And they watch over the various parts of the body of Christ that they've established. So they set up new works, and then they often will watch over them, but they don't take ownership of them. They watch over them. They often will drift from place to place, and we're going to see that towards the end of chapter 14, <clears throat> which is what I'm writing now, like, you know, 30 pages from what we're studying right now, 30 pages in my notes. Um, they're going to move back through places where they've established the body of Christ in Asia Minor. So often, because true apostles are not territorial, They'll often send others back to these places. That's why Paul sent Timothy to Macedonia, which is a region, and to Corinth and Thessalonica and Ephesus, all of which are cities. So they're not territorial, so they don't claim ownership of those places. So it's, it's okay for them to send someone else to go there and minister and have some authority because they're not territorial. They never say, my church. They never say my congregation. They never say my people. Acts 19, 21 to 22. I'm going to just read through some of these. So there's four or five examples of this. One of them is Acts 19, verse 21 to 22. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So you can see he sent somebody else in a place where he had been. 1 Corinthians 4, 17. For this reason I've sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. When he says every church, he's talking about the church in every place. So the church that's in Ephesus and the church that's in Corinth and the church that's in Thessalonica and the church that's in Berea. In first Thessalon that was on 1 Corinthians 4.17. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 and 2, he says this, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer, in the gospel of Christ to establish you, see that's one of the things that apostles do, and encourage you concerning your faith. And then in 1 Timothy 1, 1 to 3, where Paul's writing to Timothy, who he sent to a place that he had established, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, right there, you can see that's how a person becomes an apostle. God says so. By commandment, of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope to Timothy, a true son of the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So in other words, he has sent Timothy to go to a place that he established, Ephesus. He established the body of Christ in that place, leading people to Christ, recognizing elders, setting those in place, doing all the things an apostle does. And then he sent someone, not being territorial, to go there and make sure that there would be order in that place. Since it is currently fashionable for some leaders in the church today to ordain themselves to be modern-day apostles, it is up to us to observe whether or not they truly function as biblical apostles before we will receive them 
as apostles. Many of these really are local leaders in the body of Christ, and we should receive them as such, honoring God in that way for what he does to them, but not necessarily whatever titles they bestow upon themselves. God, God establishes apostles, prophets, pastors, and all that. Signs and wonders and miracles were always associated with apostles in the Bible, and it authenticated their authority as apostles. Acts 14.3. I don't want to tell you, I don't have anybody in mind. I have several friends um, that function as apostles. I have several friends that um, have the title. I don't know how they got it, but it doesn't matter to me. I'm busy being me. I'm just teaching what the scripture says about the, the topic. I'm not talking about any individuals. Okay. Acts 14.3. Therefore, I will recap that again. Therefore, they stayed there a long time after some of us hassling them. They didn't run away. They stayed there a long time, even though it was uncomfortable, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace. And how did God do that? By granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. These signs, wonders, and miracles also revealed the authority of those operating alongside the apostles. We see this in the cases of Barnabas with Paul here in Acts 14, as well as with Stephen and Philip in other places. And so we see it, you know, with, remember Stephen was with the original apostles, Acts 6, verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So associating with and working in partnership with the true apostle, others will sometimes, <clears throat> um, it's, it's kind of like it's broadcast, um, through faith and power, he did wonders and signs among the people. And then in Acts 8, uh, five to six, uh, Philip, who was also uh, working closely with the apostles, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. The multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And so the supernatural signs had a purpose, and they were basically transmitted through um, Christ through apostles in the area. So even today, these supernatural signs always accompany true apostles. That's why there is so much pressure on false apostles to publicize and promote themselves whenever God works miracles around them. Those things are not supposed to be advertising. They are supposed to reveal Jesus. Acts 4, 3, 4, but the multitude of the city was divided. Part sided with the Jews or the Jewish leaders and part sided with the apostles. So the message of the gospel divided this city. And at first, that seems strange. Shouldn't Jesus be unifying people? The message of the Lord will always divide the people. In fact, Jesus said this would happen. In Luke 12, verse 51, Jesus said this, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Now, doesn't that sound strange? When we're in Christmas season, where people are going to be talking about when the angel comes, peace on earth and goodwill to all men, that Jesus says, Do you suppose I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. I want to just pause for a second to recap. I probably talked about this in earlier videos, but not everybody's at every one of these teachings. So I just want to define the word peace. To us, in the English, peace means an absence of conflict. Peace is when people aren't arguing, there is no war, that kind of stuff. Nobody's fighting. But what peace means in the scripture, it's the word E-I-R-E-N-E -E in the Greek. And what it means is that something that was once together and has been divided apart, that's division by Satan, has now been brought back together in Christ. So peace is the coming back together. So what he's going to do is bring the opposite of peace, and he's going to divide. And I will, I will, um, I want to explain what I understand about that. And I say it that way because I really don't believe I've arrived. I think I'll be learning stuff about all the stuff we're teaching uh, right now. I'll be learning. I haven't arrived and everything, I don't believe, you know, I just believe I'm going to be learning until I'm not breathing anymore. But um, so let's look at this whole idea of Jesus bringing division. Satan has caused us all to feel isolated and alone. There are groups of people who live under the banner alone. 
These are groups who all function as if they were alone. Satan has also pitted us against each other. What started as one single family has now splintered into countless nations, countless language groups, people groups, groups defined by all sorts of activities, sinful as well as righteous, and all kinds of other groups. I mean, there's all kinds of groups that are not Jesus-oriented. Jesus came to divide us from any group that does not draw its identity from God and that does not reunify us into one family, the family of God. Jesus came to bring healthy division. The sad thing to recognize is that after we were baptized of Christ, into Christ and formed into one body, one family, Satan had a fallback plan, and it has worked. We now find ourselves as Christians divided into hundreds of splinters, all based on something physical. Some, some congregations in our community here came to be because someone had an argument about the carpet color when somebody changed the color of the carpet and there would be a division in the body of Christ. It's absolutely absurd. He, Satan has divided us into hundreds of splinters, all based on something physical, just like we were prior to Jesus dying for us. My prayer is that we will see ourselves first and foremost in terms of our spiritual sameness and will identify with who we are in Christ and stop using terms like my church, which only really keep us divided and in bondage. Perhaps Jesus will once again bring division, like he said in Luke 12, 51, and reclaim his church as one unit. I get pretty passionate about that. It's just something that's boiling in me all the time. As we saw earlier, Jesus caused division in Iconium. Acts 4, 14, 4 to 5. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jewish leaders with their rulers to abuse and stone them, and we'll just stop that verse there. It's the end of verse 5. Here we see flesh rise once again. Instead of repenting and being born again, they thought it would be better to murder the believers who were there to introduce them to eternal life in Christ. Now the words violent attempt in the New King James is translated as assault in the King James Bible. It actually means a violent impulse of the mind. They had a, when a violent attempt was made by them, a violent impulse of the mind was made by the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone Paul and Barnabas. The devil does this all the time. He inserts ideas into our minds. We tend to think these are our own ideas, or even worse, we don't even think about them. We just obey them. And in so doing, we actually do the devil's work for him. We become the devil's hands and feet. And this is why Paul tells us to actively and closely monitor our thought life. We don't hear a whole lot about this. That's why I bring it up in my studies. In 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 to 6, Paul says this, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not physical, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Strongholds are thought systems in our mind for tearing down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And how do we do that? Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The Apostle Paul is telling us, monitor our thought life, compare it against what we know to be true. This is one of the values of being in fellowship, whether it be in a big congregation someplace that has something personal happening, where you can have a small group of people you can be involved in, or a church in somebody's home, a pastoral relationship where you find yourself like I do. We have church 15, 20 times a week, two or three of us together in a room, um, doing pastoral time, doing discipleship. And in that time, we run ideas past each other. And sometimes I'll say, hey, have you ever thought about this? And what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm, 
I might be blinded to what the Holy Spirit wants me to see, but they won't be. And they can, and we'll be able to kick ideas around. And what we're doing is we're taking a thought captive, we're snagging a thought, and we're dragging it over to Jesus and saying, Jesus, what do you think about this? Do you think this is real? Now, he's actively living in us through the Holy Spirit. We also have knowledge of the Word of God. That's one of the reasons that we study the Bible. So we're going to have this standard, like Paul said, I think it's uh, 2 Timothy 1.13, um, or it might be 1 Timothy 1.13. He says, um, retain the standard of sound words. And he's talking about a measuring stick. Let's pull it over to the Word of God. Let's pull it over to the Logos. Let's pull it over to the Rhema Word of God, and let's show it to Jesus and say, what do you think about this? Is it real? So do that with other people. Well, what do you think? I was thinking that I need to do this. And here's why. And they'll say, but the scripture says, like Jesus did with Satan, it is written, you know, you, that man does not live by bread alone. It is written that, not, and, you know, he just, he uses the word of God, right? And what he's doing is he's taking the thoughts captive that Satan's giving him, and he's bringing it to his own obedience, since he is Jesus after all, and he punishes the disobedience by casting those things down. These people in Iconium were lost. That means they didn't have the Holy Spirit of God in them. And they were completely at the mercy of whatever Satan wanted to do with their thought life. And he wanted them to remain lost and under his control. You know, it's, it's kind of daunting to think about the fact that almost everybody's lost. And all of us used to be that are, are saved. We used to be lost. And that meant the Holy Spirit wasn't inside. He wasn't exercising any, any authority in our life, any kind of control in our life. We weren't yielding ourselves to him. We're basically at the mercy of Satan. All the lost people in the world, that's why they're doing the stuff they're doing. That's why they're killing babies. That's why they're practicing perverse lifestyles. That's why they're having sex outside of marriage, heterosexual and otherwise. That's why they're doing all these weird things. That's why they're killing people. That's why they're robbing people. That's why they're cheating people. That's why when somebody dies, everybody starts fighting over stuff and money. Because Satan's having a field day in their lives, and they don't even know it. I didn't know it. And so Satan wanted control of their thought life. He wanted them to remain lost and under his control. And you know, this is the case. Anytime anyone begins to be drawn to the Lord by the Father. Jesus said in John 6, verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. When the father does that, the devil almost always perks up and sends thoughts that cause the lost person to resist the Lord. That's how the spiritual battle works. We should always keep in mind that in the background, this spiritual wrangling is happening. So Acts 14, 4 to 5. I mean, that's why if you're going to share the gospel with someone or you call to someone's house and you know you're going to be ministering and it's going to involve the Holy Spirit of God basically putting order where Satan's got disorder, putting healing where Satan has disease or putting, uh, you know, some kind of um, exerting the authority of God in any kind of way. If you think you're going to have a chance to share the gospel, why don't you call somebody up or text them and tell them so they could be praying? This is a spiritual battle. It's not going to be all the great stuff we say or the great examples we have. It's going to be the Holy Spirit of God drawing a person, the Father drawing a person, using the Holy Spirit of God to Jesus. So let's get some other people in on it, shouldn't we? Acts 14, 4 to 5. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles, and when a violent attempt, when a... a, a a movement in the mind was, was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them. These people didn't hope to simply stone them to death, thus shutting them up. First, they wanted to abuse. They wanted to abuse and stone them. And this is translated from a Greek word that means to act with insolence, wantonness, wicked violence, and to treat them shamefully. This means, wanton means that it's just no holes barred. They're just going to be completely out of, out of bounds. 
It means that they wanted to act with insolence, wantonness, wicked violence, and to treat them shamefully. They wanted to humiliate Paul and Barnabas and then kill them. So we see this pattern often on the earth today. There is a spiritual group on the earth today that think it's great to rape women before they kill them and behead them. They think it's great to torment homosexual people and then throw them off of buildings. They think it's great to um, put them in a sex slavery. They think it's great to put people in cages and pour gasoline on them and, and, and humiliate them and then kill them. Same pattern on the earth today that we see back there in Acts 14. Anytime we see it, we can know for certain that Satan is behind that and prepare ourselves accordingly. And so this violent attempt was made by the Gentiles and the Jews and their rulers to abuse them, humiliate them, and then stone them. Acts 14, 6, Paul and Barnabas became aware of it and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, which are cities of Lycania, L-Y-C-A-O-N-I-A, and to the surrounding region. So Paul and Barnabas moved on to Lystra. Now Lystra was a small city about 20 miles south of Iconium. And this happens to be the hometown of Timothy, who many scholars believe came to, G to Christ during this visit there. So that's kind of cool. Some people uh, decide they're going to kill, they're going to humiliate and abuse uh, these two guys. They go to, to the next town 20 miles away. Out of it comes an amazing man who becomes a functioning apostle himself one day, Timothy. Um, Paul and Barnabas heard about the plot to kill him, and they fled. Uh, like I said, the body of Christ is fragmented. In some parts of the fragmented body of Christ today, these two productive Christians, if it happened today, would be accused of being spiritual cowards for fleeing certain death. The fact is that sometimes we're supposed to stay in places of pressure and sometimes we're supposed to leave. And this is the Lord's call. We're going to see later in this chapter that Paul um, stays. And then he's he's stoned, and then he's brought out and thrown away with the trash. Sometimes the Lord says stay. Sometimes the Lord says go. It's the Lord's call, and I'm happy to see this example in the Bible of strong Christians leaving a place of great danger because the Holy Spirit says to do so. We're just gonna let the Bible speak, right? In the background here, we see that Satan is working to stop the spread of the gospel. But in reality, the devil actually helps to spread it by causing them to move on to the next towns. Because the Bible doesn't tell us either way, it's unclear as to whether they went on to Lystra and Derby because of their fleshly fear or in obedience to the Lord. We can, though, see the result of them moving on. The very next verse Acts 14, 7 says this, and they were preaching the gospel there. So whatever their reason was to go to Lystra, it is evident that they didn't hide out in fear. Instead, they kept on preaching the gospel. They never let resistance cause them to stop their mission. That's something for us to think about. Sometimes things are going to get hard. Sometimes it's going to get really mean. I mean, I've been in places where, where people have tried to provoke me and, and have tried to humiliate me in public. Do you stay or do you go? What's the king say? If the king says stay, you stay. If the king says go, you go. The last place that happened, I stayed because I knew the Lord wanted me to stay. And then I, I knew when he released me and I, I informed the people and I moved on. We can't let resistance cause us to stop our mission. You know, some said that the army of God is an all-volunteer army, and that's cool. But I think the army of God is much more than that. We are an army of what some people call dedicates. It comes from the word dedicate. It's, it's spelled just the same as dedicates is. When the word dedicate is used as a noun, a dedicate, is used as a noun, it means one who is set apart to a definite use. 
In other words, we are dedicated. We are committed to him. We are committed to his will. And when we live that way, we get to see his plan unfold and we flourish. Sadly, because there is so little true discipleship in the church today, most Christians do not seem to be living as dedicates. No one has taught them that to be a Christian means that we don't belong to ourselves anymore. But the truth is, is when we ask Jesus to be our Lord, the word Lord means owner, and we ask Jesus to purchase us with his blood and with his life and with his suffering and with his death, and now we belong to him. When people are born again, but do not know this very key aspect to being a Christian, they tend to not be dedicated to Jesus. They remain dedicated to themselves and their own needs, their own desires, their own plans. The list is endless. That's why it's so easy to get people to be dedicated to a subset of the body of Christ, like a congregation or a ministry, and not dedicated to the person of Jesus. The subset will come before the Lord, and that's just wrong. They never get to see God's plan unfold, and they never experience the thrill of knowing that they're a part of it happening. They never flourish like they could, and that's why I get so irritated about the lack of discipleship. You know, speaking speaking of that point, if if a person decides like like I, I hadn't been taught about discipleship. Um, I was in ministry, and I began to stumble across it and realized that the Great Commission, the number one thing was to make disciples, not members and not converts, and I began to study it. And it's been about five years now that I've really gone after discipling, and I realized some of the stuff I was doing was discipling, some of it wasn't. Um, and so I began to try to approach it and frame how I did things to do it that way, what I found is, is that uh, some of the people want to be discipled. They want to be students of Christ. And some people don't because it's not flashy. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes it's rather low key. It's relationship oriented. And some people don't like being in a relationship. I don't know all the reasons. I just know I love people and I love our king and I love to serve. And if and all I know to do, you can get frustrated if people don't do what you think they're supposed to do. It's a complete waste of perfectly good frustration. Um, I think what we need to do is be be if God has called you to be something, go be it. You be in a position, be fluid, be flexible, be available to be that. If you're called to disciple people, be available to do it. Study the word of God, study discipling. Uh, talk to people about it, people that are doing it. Be equipped, and God will bring some people to you. Some of them will stick around. Some of them will go adrift. Some of them will blow you off completely. Some of them will be pretty hateful about it. <laughs> but really, the whole idea is that you satisfy your calling in Christ. And, I, and we can't measure the success by visible results. We have to measure the success by whether or not we are doing what Jesus told us to do. That success. Jesus did what his father said to do, 100% successful, even though most people will never receive him. If you go uh, judging by visible results, then that makes Jesus a fairy, but we know he's not. And so that's my encouragement to you. Um, let's commit to being discipled and to discipling someone else. The primary reason the first century church grew like it did and stood unwavering under intense persecution was because those people knew they did not belong to themselves. They knew that they were God's people for him to do with as he saw fit. And they knew that he was good and that he would do what was best. And we, the modern church, needs to recapture that for itself. And I believe that we can be unwavering and we can have an explosion of true growth and not just be trading members back and forth among ministries and congregations. So they went to Lystra and Derby, and Acts 14, 7 says they were preaching the gospel there. 
In verse 8, and in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. It's important that we see something here. So let's go back briefly to earlier in our study in Acts, to Acts 3, verses 2 to 9. We're going to see something similar here. It says, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb. Same thing. A cripple from his mother's womb, it says in Acts 14, 8. Whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. He was asking for um, money. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from him. Give me some money. Then Peter said, in silver and gold I have none, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, the formerly lame man, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. So let's see this in Acts 14, verse 8. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb. In both cases, there was a man who had been severely disabled his whole life. Everyone knew this. In Acts 3, 3 to 4, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. In Acts 14, verse 9, this man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. In both cases, an apostle saw the man focused. That means to observe intently, was really focusing on him and addressed him. In cases like this, the Holy Spirit will literally set our focus on a need. It's almost as if we would have to work to not see it. So I'm jumping back from Acts 3 to Acts 14 to compare these two lame men. In Acts 3, 6 to 8, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up and stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. In Acts 14, 9 to 10, this man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up, straight on your feet. And the man leaped and walked. In both cases, each apostle addressed the situation, con con commanded the, the infirm man to do something that he could not do. And the lame men were able to do it because both men were healed by the same Lord Jesus through those apostles. Now, years ago, I did prison ministry all the time. I did that for many years. During that time, I felt led to try something. I would be ministering in a prison or a jail, and I would just prowl around asking the Lord who I should approach. Almost always, because I was asking, opening my heart, almost always I would have a sudden intense desire to approach a particular prisoner. Every time that happened, without fail, ministry would happen, and something significant would happen for the inmate. And I believe the apostles operated like that. That's why I tried it, always expecting the Lord to direct them. I believe the Lord God still does that with his people, so I would like to encourage us all to try that. Ask the Lord what to do and see if you get prompted to do something to address an immediate need. It's exciting, and yes, it does work. So let's go back to verse 9 and see something. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observed, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Paul looked at the man intently. He focused on him. He's making sure of something. He focused on him. I think he looked at him with more than just earthly eyes. I believe he looked at the man with spiritual eyes too. So when it says, seeing that he had faith to be healed, 
it means that Paul could somehow see this in the spirit. Now there is a truth that doesn't seem to be spoken about or taught much in the body of Christ. And this is a tra tragic reaction, I believe, caused by the fragment of the body of Christ that overreacts to the excesses of the fragment of the church that is labeled the charismatic church. There are non-charismatics that react against the excesses of parts of the body of Christ. It's tragic because it's led so many of us living as if all we are is spiritual beings with a belief system in our minds who will, if we're lucky, someday be spiritual beings once we die and go to heaven. The truth is that Christians live in two realms at once, the spiritual and the physical realms. We are at once eternal spiritual beings that live out our Christianity in a physical body on this physical plane, what we call the earth. Here in Acts 14 is a lost man who understandably is consumed with this physical problem. If you were lame from birth, you would think about it all the time. Paul and the others showing up represents the collision of two worldviews, but more importantly, two realities. It's the collision of the physical and the spiritual. Then he hears and sees life in Paul, which brings his focus to the one person who has been chosen to introduce the spiritual world to him. In turn, Paul sees something in the man, faith, which is like a priming of the spiritual pump. It represents receivability, that element which enables a person to absorb into their earthly lives something spiritual. This happens because a spiritual being, Jesus, is about to pour a spiritual power, healing, into his spiritual body, physical body pouring it down from the throne in heaven. Every time we minister Jesus into any circumstance, that very dynamic happens through us. I find that to be exceedingly cool. Acts 14, 9. This man heard Paul speaking, observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed. What does that term, faith to be healed, mean? I ask because we hear that concept mess with a lot these days. Based on the meaning of the word faith, here is how I define the term that um, Luke uses when he says he had faith to be healed. The man had the capacity to, and Paul could see that the man had the capacity to entrust himself to the Lord in regards to his healing. Paul could see that the man had the capacity to entrust himself to the Lord Jesus in regards to his healing. And the thing is, there's a good chance he had no idea who Jesus was because it seems that Paul and company had just walked up on him. Most likely, he had faith because of Paul's faith. He saw something in Paul too. And this can almost sound non-biblical the way I stated it, but it's not, is it not why anyone ever gets saved? They see something of Jesus and whoever it is that leads them to the Lord. To be sure, when that happens, it's Jesus working through them. In this passage, we see a real event recorded which involves real people, just like you and me. Acts 14, 9 and 10. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. This man is primed by virtue of his own faith to receive what is about to happen to him, and then it does, instantly. He just doesn't know he's healed yet. So Paul commands him to do something that if he wasn't healed, he would not be able to do. He says, stand up straight on your feet. You know, it's not just his legs that didn't work prior to the healing. It's that his soul also didn't know how to stand and that his mind didn't know what it was like to command that to happen. His feelings didn't know how it felt emotionally, how to stand. Healing, whether it be physically 
emotionally, mentally, or spiritually is a huge deal. And when this happens to this day, sometimes people are healed and they don't know it because they can't sense the healing in a way they think it should be able to feel and that they should be able to sense it. To address this, God will give them an opportunity to experience it. In this case, it's command from the Apostle Paul. Stand up straight on your feet. The term stand straight up means to stand perfectly erect. Led by the Holy Spirit to do so, Paul commands a man lame from birth to not only stand up on his own power, but to stand up perfectly erect. You know, if you've ever injured a leg or an ankle or your foot, you know that you become aware of how many muscle movements it takes you to do that. Now just imagine that you had atrophied legs that are suddenly healed. Your legs are atrophied. Those muscles have never been used. It's suddenly healed, and then someone is commanding you to do this perfectly. The man's brain has never commanded his legs to do this. A second before his soul didn't know how to process this. This man gets to experience a miraculous healing in his body, and God puts muscle memory in there, and he puts into the man's soul an instantaneous understanding of something that babies take months to learn, how to command your legs to stand and walk. All this happens instantly. Excuse me, I have something in my eye. Just imagine if Paul commanded you to fly. You would think, I've never flown. I don't know how to fly. And the next moment, you find yourself flying without reasoning through it all. That formerly lame man experienced something like that on that day. Every instance of miraculous healing by God involves that sort of experience for the person who is healed. Especially if he's being healed of a lifelong ailment or a condition or anything for which he has given up hope of ever being healed. Isn't that beautiful? This man, Paul, this man heard Paul speaking, and Paul observing him intently, seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and he walked. Acts 14, 9 to 10. So what we're going to do is see the five elements of, of um, ministry here. I'll probably post this in the comments to the video or maybe in the comments to this uh, after we're done. I believe there are five elements to a ministry. I think I've written on this in my articles on the website. The five elements of, of um, ministry. These elements are always present in healings, in situations where healing is complete. Now, I'm putting element four first because that's usually the part we notice that kicks off the whole sequence. So the fourth element is that a person has, an, this man had an incredible need to be healed. The first element existed before that. God has, has an unlimited supply of healing for this guy. The second element is that God is motivated to heal and has someone there who will obey and carry out the healing to that man. That's Paul. He's a yielded vessel. The third element, he's got faith to be healed. He is receptive. And finally, I guess there's four elements. <laughs> Where's number five? Must be four elements. Oh, I have to fix that. Um, the fourth element, the man practiced. No, that's the fifth. Yeah, that's what happened. The number is up there. So the fourth element, the man has an incredible uh, need to be healed. The first is God has an unlimited supply of healing for the man. The second is God is motivated to heal, and he's got someone who's motivated to help. Paul is a willing vessel. The third is the man is receptive. And five, the man practices the healing that has been given to him. He obeys, and he does something in partnership with what God has done with him. And at that point, we're going to pick up again right where we are, but we're going to look at more of this because we're going to look at something about uh, leaping and walking next time. It's time for us to, for this to draw to a close. Um,
I'm really enjoying this. I'm having a ball today. This has been a fun teaching. Um, um, I hope you come back next time. I hope you come back every time. Um, this will be posted on the website at this place. Oops, I better type it in right here. Uh, it's going to be at that place. Um, um, I also have a section on there. If you just go to mikemac.org, you can see this. But we have a button for articles. We have a button for videos. Uh, after, after Facebook is finished processing this, then I'm going to download this to my computer. I'm going to upload it to my YouTube channel. Um, this is my YouTube channel. Um, uh, then I then I will um, when that happens, the button on videos uh, will show this as the most recent video. Right now, it's last week's video. I appreciate y'all being here. I appreciate all the comments, all the all the um, things y'all do to interact. I, I love that. It's really encouraging for me. Um, I'm having a ball. I am, I am like, how many pages ahead? I'm. This is page. We just finished page 396. I have written page 416. I have three more lines. I have 417. This is going to be an 800, 850 page uh, text by the time we're done, because uh, we're only halfway through the book. Um, I'm having a ball doing it. It really doesn't matter how many pages it is. It's just kind of amazing. When I put this in my notebook and it's that thick, it's gonna be it's gonna be a six inch binder when I'm done. Um, let's pray, Father. I thank you for um, for all the things that you share with us. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the people that are interested in learning about it, Father. I ask you to correct anything that's out of order in our lives. I ask you to correct uh, anything that's out of order in any group. I ask you to correct anything that's out of order in the body of Christ as a whole. I ask you to convict me, uh, reveal to me, convict me the things that I'm not doing correctly, the sin in my life. I ask you to do that for us all. I know you're motivated, Father. We open our hearts up to you to do with it as you would see fit. I ask you to teach us if we don't already know it, that we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to you. I ask you to teach us how to hear your voice better. I ask you to aim us at individuals and situations that you have grace for us to function in. And I ask you to show us the exciting building of your kingdom by allowing us to be a part of it. Father, there's a number of us who are ill. I haven't been up to snuff today uh, for the last two and a half days, day and a half or so, two days. I haven't been well. Uh, I ask you to, to make me well. I ask you to be with Tanya, who's sick today. I ask you to be with Tina, be with Michael, be with the others. All the prayer requests that we send out. Um, I want to remind anybody, uh, let me finish praying. Father, I ask you to bless us now. And uh, thank you for this Bible study. I thank you for allowing us to use Facebook to do it. And I praise you for these things in Jesus' name. I want to remind you that you can always send prayer requests to me. Uh, through Facebook message or my email. Uh, if you want my email address, just Facebook message me. I don't put it on open Facebook. So I'll see you next time. Thanks for coming. It's very encouraging to see all you guys there. We love you. Yeah, uh, Gary and I ate chicken today. I'm sure that's helped to heal me. Uh, I had diagnosed myself as having a fried chicken uh, shortage, and that's the reason. So love you guys. Joe, I'm so excited to see you here. I hope, I hope um, you come every single time, and I hope I get to meet you one day. God bless you guys. I'll see you all next time. Uh, be with Jesus. Amen.